I want us to become brothers again like we used to be, and for us to find ourselves and bond with each other. Can we agree to that? Opinions vary. Welcome to Three Brothers Filmcast, a monthly roundtable podcast where the brothers behind threebrothersfilm.com have substantial, nuanced conversations about film. I'm Anton Bergstrom, and I'm here with my brothers. Anders. And Aaron. My last name is the same as my brother's. And this month, we're verse-jumping between two multiverse movies that have dominated the film box office and discourse this spring. We're talking about the Daniels' eclectic, absurdist, sci-fi, kung fu, family drama, everything, everywhere, all at once, and the latest installment in the seemingly infinite yet repetitive Marvel Cinematic Universe, Sam Raimi's Doctor Strange in the Multiverse of Madness. Now, this episode also marks two firsts for Three Brothers Filmcast. First, we're finally digging into a film by Marvel, not just using them as a punching bag for our frustrations with the film industry. Second, I believe, and maybe my hunch is wrong, but I think this is the first time the brothers are in agreement on the podcast about a negative take on a film. What can we say? We just usually talk about movies we like. But before we get started, we just want to thank you for listening to this podcast and for reading the website. We want to encourage you, if you like this show, to really share it with friends, family, acquaintances, old school friends and group chats, neighbors you talk to, and solicitors who started knocking on doors again. As well, if you like the show, please give it a five-star rating and review on Apple, Spotify, or whatever podcatcher you're using. Those ratings and reviews really do help new listeners find the show by improving our rankings, and we really want to continue to grow the community of people who are joining in the conversation. And if you'd like to see us do more, such as maybe record video for the podcast and create short videos for YouTube, please consider supporting us on Patreon. A small one-time donation can be really helpful. I will say that we are going to be doing more with Patreon this fall and cooking up some good stuff this summer for you. But now, on with the show. Okay, Ramblers, let's get rambling. I'm not your husband. I'm another version of one from another universe. I'm here because we need your help. Very busy today. Uh, no time to help you. Across the multiverse, I've seen thousands of Evelyns. You can access all their memories, their emotions, even their skills. There's a great evil spreading throughout the many verses. And you... Be your only chance of stopping it. Don't make me fight you. I am really good. I don't believe you. It's a big, wide multiverse out there, kid. But in the end, it's a small world after all. Sadly, those cobbled together cliches I just stated kind of describe the contradictions between the scope, the whole multiverse of potential, and the relatively narrow narrative interests in both films which tend to point inward on the personal lives, family relations, and self-growth of the main characters. But what's the point of a multiverse movie if you just want to tell the same story again and again? Or maybe that's the point of all this, right? Let's start with Everything Everywhere All at Once, which skyrocketed after its South by Southwest premiere in March to its status as the most talked about film of the moment, or maybe last month's moment, amongst film buffs. Written and directed by Dan Kwan and Daniel Scheinert, who go by the Daniels, It's currently A24's biggest box office earner ever, bringing in over 62 million worldwide to date. For a time, it enjoyed the number one slot on Letterboxd's rankings. It now resides at number five, while standing at number 72 on IMDb's top 250. Those who like it seem to like it a lot. It's been aptly labeled the film of the moment for so-called nice core folks. Viewers who just love movies about the lovable weaknesses of characters and the messiness of human life. What's interesting is how the film is really that kind of a movie, but told through the multiverse narrative structure. At the same time, the film is an intense, bizarre streak, which either works and is funny for you, or doesn't. The Daniels use absurdism to probe the usual existential question of meaning in both a seemingly absurd and meaningless universe, and within an individual life, that of Michelle Yeoh's laundromat owner, wife, and mother, Evelyn Kwan Wong, who has lost her sense of purpose, if she ever had it. In everything, everywhere, all at once, the multiverse affords the space for self-reflection and personal and family therapy, as the protagonist, Evelyn, can see her choices and the consequences of them literalized through the different possibilities of the multiverse, something that Doctor Strange does as well, to a lesser extent. Aaron, since I saw everything, everywhere, all at once with Anders, I already know his reaction, 
but I'm not exactly sure where you land on the film, although I have suspicions. Did you like it? Uh, do you find this multiverse to be maddeningly small, or rather well-constructed and thoughtful? So I, I wanted to like it, <laughs> and I didn't. Um, I would say that hate is too strong a word, even if I find some of the over-the-top hyperbole that is existing on the internet around this film actually frustrating because it it has more to do with reactions um and just the kind of general climate of how people like things online than it does it about this specific movie it's like you know everybody has to give a five star or one star review yeah on letterboxd yeah. everybody has to love a movie or hate a movie there's no in-betweens there's no simply thinking it's fine or having some problems with it or or not even thinking about it that much <laughs> you know it's just like moving on to the next thing but so with this movie i went into it knowing that it was a beloved film and so i tried really really hard to be open to it and for the first around third the the whole chapter of the movie titled everything yep. i was mostly with it and i thought it was interesting and it, it kind of it, it's an inventive concept about this multiverse it has um, once kind of the fight scenes start happening there's some actual fun there with the choreography and the um the incorporation of kind of practical humor into the fight scenes which is something that doesn't happen that much anymore in hollywood yeah yeah and and i even liked some of the kind of rules that it constructs for itself with with the other um, versions of wayman coming in and telling evelyn how to how to you know do the jump and this is what's happening and we have to fight jobu tapaki and yeah. all this and that and the other and it kind of builds this this not necessarily a quest narrative but this kind of larger conflict that you think you have some kind of bearing on and that it's going to somehow move forward on this track. But almost true to the sense of modern conceptions about the universe, which, you know, kind of like a multiverse, people woefully misunderstand when it comes in, in pop culture conceptions of it. Like, it, it, this movie in its structural um, build is actually almost kind of like the idea of a expanding and contracting universe in that it expands hugely into this concept of possibility and all these yeah. different choices that can spiral out into almost kind of like a nervous system of the universe. You know, each each nerve ending creates a new one and you can go off all these paths, but then it contracts to the most basic understanding of human meaning, which is just like, you got to hug your family. And it's just, yeah. I, I know it works for some people, but I'm like, it sums up like this. The movie constantly has this um, refrain, everything is meaningless, everything is meaningless, nothing matters, you know, the, everything bagel will absorb everything, we can get into that after. And people's response to that is like, the world, life is meaningless, so it's only the meaning that you, you know, create with the people you love. And I'm like, that's not true. Like, the meaning of life is not just to, like, feel loved, or to build bridges with your family or whatnot. It's it's just the movie, but the movie hits that note so hard over and over. And it's like, don't you agree? Don't you agree? We're going to have 45 minutes of, we want you to agree. I'll, I'll pull back. But ultimately I found that it's attempts at kind of profundity fell really flat for me and distracted from all the other things I liked. Yeah. Okay. You bring up a lot of, a lot of good stuff. I, I concur in that. I think that the movie, I didn't like it, but it's not because it's like a mess. Um, it's more because the choices they made, which are not like bad choices in terms of storytelling, ultimately like don't seem substantial or or it's just like silly. Like a lot of it just like I didn't like like the absurdism. I, I did not enjoy. I didn't find it funny. It it, it was off putting. But um, I think you're also right about like this um, expansion and then contraction back to like kind of just like a very like um, trite view of like where meaning comes from it's a hallmark card well and also like i mean the whole thing f works on like so the daughter joy who is also like you know the uh the arch universal villain can't even never say the name jobu tupaki no i feel like none of the characters can even say it too and you're like why did it have this name they said it was like a joke and then they just kept it and you're like okay <laughs> if uh meaning is kind of just like you know, um, you choosing to be kind to those around you and hug your family. You're like, I don't, I'm not sure the movie actually embraces sort of like the potential, like the choice to sort of be embrace the nihilism as much as it could. If like, if that's sort of like an option, you know, an existential option, like, does it allow joy or Jobu to like actually, actually have like a valid point of just being like, no, like nothing is meaningless and everything can be destroyed. Who cares? 
<laughs> Anders wade into this deep, deep uh, existential questions. I mean, like, I think the only thing I want to say is like, we, we got to also talk about the movie and not just its philosophy. So I'll start by saying that my response to the film was pretty similar to Aaron's um, in that uh, I wanted to like the movie. I really did. I was... Um, did you, Anders? Did you? No, I did. I did want to like it because a lot of people who, you know, in some areas, are to, my taste may overlap a little bit, did like the film. Okay, yeah. Um, and I never saw the Daniels' first film, Swiss Army Man, but the very concept of it was sort of off-putting to me. <laughs> <laughs> so I just, and it, so I didn't really like, like it's about a farting corpse, that, but it's a really heartwarming tale. And from the, that's what I gather. And <laughs> yeah. ultimately, I guess I should have uh, realized that that is <laughs> what their shtick is. But um, I wanted to like it because I, I like Michelle Yeoh. Um, you know, I, I was really excited about, uh, you know, a well done science fiction film that wasn't a, a franchise film. Yeah. And definitely it gets kudos for like being, you know, uh, a unique creation. Yeah. The problem is, and, and, and I actually really like Aaron, the first third of roughly of the film, I was pretty on board with it. I thought actually some of the filmmaking in the, the house with the family dynamic uh, of, you know, multi-generational Chinese immigrants in, you know, running a laundromat. I actually, it's the old saying that we, we've often said on the website that you critique a film for what it is and not what, for what it isn't. But honestly, I would have been probably happier watching a movie about that family, right? Um, I was really happy and excited to see uh, Ki Hui Kwan, uh, you know, short round from Temple of Doom, which yeah, on the screen. Yeah. And and I will say, if I can be maybe focused on some of the positives, I think he's one of the best parts of the film. And I'd love to see him get more th things to do because he, I think he manages both his performance in, in an emotional level and the the various versions of his character the most effectively. And the and the kung fu side. Yeah, well, the, 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 and Aaron, Aaron alluded to the, 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 the fight scene with his uh, the fanny pack. Is, is yeah, and that, like, that's one of the that's highlights of the I movie like. is I the like fanny pack And fight again, scene. it was once they started to delve too deeply into their own mythology, which they ultimately don't really care very much about, frankly, that it got too much. And I wouldn't necessarily say it's a... a a poorly made film. I think it's clear there's skill mm -hmm. here. I think some of the uh, you know transitions between universes and stuff are well done. I think a lot of the the lighting and stuff, uh, you know, it, it, it looks quite nice. It has a personality compared with a lot of films. I have some issues with their aesthetic choices, and that comes yeah. down to you yeah. you you alluded you alluded to the film a few times as absurdist, and it is. But I actually do like a lot of absurdist comedy where they take something and push it beyond like the limit or you, you it's a pure complete non sequitur but there's it's more than just the like absurdism in that sense it's there's a sort of i, I kind of tried to describe it as like so random it's like it's just someone on the internet oh so random bacon you know epic bacon kind of humor if i want to put it that way but but for nice people <laughs> Does that make sense what I'm saying? Well, yeah, uh, like, can I can I just sort of jump in there? Because partly my descriptor of it as absurdist is partly because that is one of the words people are, are labeling this. Yeah. Uh, in, 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 in terms of, like, a shorthand, like, if I'm trying to describe, like, you know, okay, the, one of these uh, universes has people who have hot dogs for fingers. My least you know, favorite like, part of the film. Yeah, no, I, I, I wish I had never seen that. That, you know, like, so absurd describes that. But at the same time, there's something arch so arch about their absurdist choices that it doesn't seem like it's like the expression of sort of like the like the true sort of unconscious or subconscious and like weird in that way it's not surreal yeah so it's absurd but not surreal and there's this isn't to be david like, lynch let's just say yeah i don't even think it's particularly absurd because absurdity is part of the things with absurdity is that it's not beholden to the rules of expectation but it's also not beholden to the rules of like taste. And this movie's extremely safe with a lot of like, yeah, there's butt plug jokes and stuff, but it also really doesn't want to offend anybody. But what about like the hot dog thing? Like, isn't that like to That's me just it's stupid. Just, it, it is stupid, but like it's also like to me, like aesthetically it was so bothersome. It's ugly. But, like I just I didn't like but you know I, what but I mean? I, but that, but that I will to say seems that absurd, I'm still right? To, like that's pushing it. Yeah, but I'm trying to work out what it is I think about it. I think you hit on it there, Aaron, saying that it's like or an, an Anton that it's not necessarily it doesn't feel like the expression of a true 
anything goes kind of it's calculated. Ran, you know, it is just sort of ran, random, calcul but calculated sort of Too calculated. Twitter humor, if you want to put it that way. I don't know how better to put it. Like, there is, you know, movies that are intentionally ugly and aesthetically unpleasant that I like. I think of like some of Terry Gilliam's films, right? Yeah, yeah. Like they're yeah. they're genuinely unpleasant at times, but it, yeah, I don't, it like but they're not. To almost look at but yet the there's a there's messy. an aesthetic. Maybe we're getting into too much into the weeds, but it, there there's no. You're, I think maybe it's that idea of unity. Yeah, it, it just it walked that edge for the first third where I was like, yes, I'm with you. And then it just lost me. Can I just say, like, I think maybe this will help you. Like, you sort of said, like, I think at the end it gets maybe too much. And maybe it's actually not too much. It's too little. Yeah, right? like, that's actually a good point. You know, we have a couple of really goofy universes. And we actually don't see that many. But I wanted to pick this up with the idea of the multiverse. It's that, I mean, Aaron, you said we don't want to get into, like, too much into scientific concepts or even narrative concepts of the multiverse. But the idea of a multiverse is this idea it, what it introduces is, that is of narrative interest is the idea that every decision that we make is consequential insofar as that we could have made a different decision. And it, it generates an, an infinite uh, you know, path of branching possibilities, right? The, yeah. A lot of good time, a lot of time travel uh, uh, stories deal with multiverse because it's this idea that uh, you know, time you know, requires this. To the, the, the possible choices that we make to generate different universes. Um, but as you said, Aaron, I mean, on another level, they, even if they all is, is existed or are possible, whatever that even means, existence at this point, what is existence, right? I mean, this is where you start going when you start, it, it starts to sound like, you know, dorm room philosophizing. But the, the film never, doesn't really stick with that idea. It kind of is like anything, it doesn't stay, you know, they, they introduced this idea that you got to stay sort of close to parallel universes that, that just might represent, like, different choices, like whether Evelyn Wayman, uh, you know, went, decided to move to America or never got together, right? I think that, and that, that difference is one of the more effective ones. It creates this kind of sliding doors, uh, parallel universe kind of idea. But some of the other ones seem too aggressively out of left field, and so they have no bearing on our, our interest they're actually too different from the characters for you to actually care about. what i think here is and why i don't want to harp on the movie is it misunderstands a sci-fi version of a multiverse i you know my that's my own personal thoughts on multiverses and, and them being dumb but i understand that this movie uses the multiverse as like you know just a narrative device to explore what if yeah it's therapy no but it's it's what if and it's the idea of assign consequence to the actions in your life yeah, in which a yeah. life seems it, meaningless. And that's that's important and that's a good it's a good idea. My issue with it is that you take that you can't take that you can't like you know, this movie is what, almost two and a half hours. I feel like in charting a kind of unified praise a, like praise of this film, people try and chart this this they pull on the threads of the specific emotional through line and it discard the things that seem to undo it. And it's like, okay, so if this movie is about the what ifs, what do the rocks have to do with any of that? Yeah, rocks exactly. have nothing to do with a what if. This is a universe in which humans never exist. Therefore, Evelyn doesn't exist in that universe. Therefore, we shouldn't see it. It does it for a joke. It's a solipsistic vision of a multiverse because it's infinite universes. Of you. But arranged, yeah, arranged around you. Which and is like, why the poster so has, like, the mandala so it, yeah, it reminds thing. me, uh, season season five of uh, Better Call Saul, there's the point where Mike's like, you're on a road, and you, you know, you can go this way, that way, and you're walking down the road. And, like, like that's kind of, like, the, that's, the, it basically sums up the whole film's, like, philosophy, right? It's just, like, it's one person's choices branching out to a multiverse, but it's not taking the origin point of the multiverse as the actual origin point of whenever the universe was created so, it, it, so it's, it's not it's, it's, it's not actually almost it, it's almost more branching out mostly from her like it's it's therapeutic sol solipsistic vision consumes its approach to the multiverse maybe it's like you said maybe there is something out there some new discovery that will make us feel like even small pieces of shit something that explains why you still went looking for me through all of this noise. And why? No 
no matter what, I still want to be here with you. I will always, always want to be here with you. Okay, but that fits. The one thing I will say, though, it fits with the um, message of the film, which is that the ultimate goal is to find personal happiness. And, and specifically, I would say happiness, because a lot of the other things that they show, because a lot of the other, other possible happy worlds for the, some of the other characters and things like that are all about self-fulfillment. They're all about pleasure, essentially, yeah. and feeling good about yourself. Right? An, emotional, Success. an emotional feeling. An emo- it's an emotional feeling. Um, and there's no sense in the film, really, that, um, that it's possible that actually that might not be the highest good. I think you, we've mentioned already. Your connection to other people, that, or maybe your connection to your family might be very important, but not only for you to feel good about it, but for maybe the next generation of your family to, to, find, to find meaning or to yeah. carry on a story or, or to carry on good a beyond, meaning. Exactly. Beyond ourselves yourself. Ourselves even. Yeah. So, and that fits, though, with the model of the universe that they present, too, which yeah. is solipsistic. Yeah. So there is a sort of aesthetic, uh, philosophical unity in the film, which someone might find successful, but I personally don't. So maybe that underscores that it, maybe this movie is better even if I don't like it. Well, no, is that it's an it's a uni- actual unified artistic vision. Part of my issues are philosophical with the movie, I also think that this solipsistic aspect, this kind of fatalistic emotionalism of the film is actually very attractive to the vast majority of people at this moment. Whether that is because of a lack of religious meaning or whatnot, like you can go on these, or just philosophical meaning in general, you can go down that rabbit hole and you can unpack that. Again, I don't really want to hold the movie that against the movie for it... uh, there's a reason why it speaks to certain people. Yeah, I think yeah. that a lot of people there are, are very movies shallow, I admire so that's fine. that are philosophies I completely disagree with. No, well, like we just talked about ambulance last time. It's not like I think ambulance <laughs> yeah. is like a great philosophical statement for how you should live your life. I just thought it. Was, I thought you're not you're not a, boosting Bay's philosophy. No, what? but it's a movie that gives you a coherent art um, and artistic and entertainment vision of that universe which has its own internal logic which it is consistent to i actually don't think this movie is consistent mm-hmm. to its own logic but furthermore oh, okay which, which, act- which where that's where i want to i want to well understand. i don't think it first of all it's just it creates like on just a pure story world level it creates rules and then it ignores the rules to forward hmm. its philosophical points later in the film on a structural level it's a movie that Bills itself as having three distinct acts, but actually has a 45-minute climax, which is absurd. Yeah. Like, th- no movie needs a 45-minute climax unless you're Lord of the Rings, Return of the King, and you're ending, like, a 12-hour story. Thirdly, it's a movie that completely... And this, this I actually think, is my main issue with the movie, hmm. is that it completely misjudges the ratio between jokes and sentiment. So there's a thing, and I'm ripping a bit on Callum Marsh's really good letterboxed review of this in which he goes uh, down the rabbit hole of looking at Dan Harmon's writing and specifically the episode remedial chaos theory in community. And in my Hmm. mind, I also then think of Rick and Morty episodes, which all share a kind of flippant, anything goes random absurdity to its humor that this does. The issue with that is that, and there's an, um, there's a sentimental through line in all that work too. But the issue is that those works smuggle the emotionalism in through a huge quantity of jokes. It's like you're going to get 10 jokes, and when you the 10th one comes, you start to realize that, oh, there's actually some meaning here, whether for the character or for yourself viewing it. And so it, it kind of like, you know, it yeah, tricks yeah. you into having an emotional reaction to something that seems flippant. And you didn't realize it was there, right? This like movie until it's delivered. is like, we're going to give you we're going to give you the blood butt plug action scene, which is absurd. And so many people are like, that's the funniest thing I ever seen in my life. And I'm like, I, it's kind of amusing because it takes the idea of you have to do something ridiculous that you'd never do to jump between the universes and yeah, like grab yeah. those skills. And it takes it to the furthest extent. Also, it has that shot of that award where I'm like, that's coming into play later. You don't linger on a yeah, thing yeah. like that without bringing it up. But so it, it does something like that, but then it will spend how many minutes in this film are devoted to the conversation between Waymond and Evelyn 
in the like Wong Kar Wai version universe, how many <laughs> how many minutes are spent between just her and Joy like talking to each other about meaning? And it it gets to the point where like there was like forty minutes to go, and the movie just stopped telling jokes. Yeah, well, and it just kept trying to make you cry with with its stylistic music video approach, which is that if you can you can affect people's emotions through the stylistic format in which you're relaying your story so that it, it's like if we just have the music hit at this moment and we have this amount of sensory overload you're going to feel this way and we're going to extend that as long as possible and i'm like but the actual message underneath is just so like lame but it makes sense if 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 meaning is emotion is feeling then that approach makes sense right like that's the guiding us that's the like the guiding approach, right? Because your meaning is derived by your emotional connection with others in this film. Thereby, if you if you cultivate the, the appropriate feel in the audience, it's conveying the meaning. That's like I think that's the point. But it's also like if you're talking about ratio, right? Like, yeah, this movie's a it's a ten feels to one joke kind of movie. It's but not, think about the, the hot dog fingers. It does the hot dog joke. And then like does the, it too much. The, the initial time it does the joke. And then by like the third time, it's like, oh, they're in like a relate, like Jamie Lee Curtis and her in a relationship. <laughs> they're trying to and play it, it doubles for down and triples down and quadruples down. And it's like, this is supposed to be meaningful. It's like, no, this is it was a only joke. humorous as a throwaway joke. You've now, you've had your cake and you want to eat it. Or eat the fingers. Is that <laughs> The humor goes into like family guy territory where it's just like, you've done, you've, you, it, it's trying to do like it, it, it trying to extend it and have it be almost like awkward and make it funny and you can't but do for that me, but it's like it's like they don't pull you up. can do that but like they don't they don't, don't do try it. and make me cry then so here like, it's <laughs> like the uh, the hot dogs uh like the, the butt plug like action scene like those things would be really funny if if they had um like Mon- monty python control like you know like you do they that. almost need more commitment to the bit yeah, more, more, more commitment style, to the bit, but you just like push it to the next. It's like okay, you have hot dogs now. What's the next step? But that, that's the thing. They don't take so okay. So they don't do the Monty Python where it's like you fire off something that's hilarious and you cut it before you would normally end it. Yeah. And then they don't do a Mister Show where like we're gonna like go so long, but we don't just continue the same thread. We're gonna like level it, and then we're gonna level it one more time, and then when you'd even think you could possibly level up this joke one more time. Then we do it. Yeah. So it does neither of those approaches, and that's why it gets boring for the humor. It just left me all kind of exhausted. That's the thing. It, <laughs> do you know what I, movie it reminded me the most of in my reaction to it, and compared to the general public, is uh, Sorry to Bother You. Oh, yeah. Another another which film, I haven't seen. Actually. Yeah. Another film, though, that establishes a particular uh, sort of absurd concept in order to explore some ostensibly serious or, or in this case, political, social allegory type thing. And then abandon it. In the case of... In the case uh, of, uh, sorry to bother you. And then also abandons it about halfway through the movie for something else that's supposed to be greater, but that muddles their allegory. And, and then on top of that, it has just the most like kind of self-satisfied, obvious uh, kind of jokes. And that's, and that's kind of the issue. It's like, you know, and again, a movie I kind of wanted to like because it was kind of sympathetic to yeah, some yeah. of its ideas and things like that, but it just left me the really the wrong way. Can I, I'll defend this movie though. This movie is so much more... Um, Competently f- made. Yeah, formally competent. Yes, like, absolutely. It, they know what they're There's doing no question the to me. There were scenes in, uh, sorry to bother you, where I was like, Wait, well, why why do they have an, also like why why do they also like plotting scripting like why do they have an apartment now what, what's going on here it's because it's because he only knows how to write twitter threads he doesn't know how to yeah make i know movies. i know but i'm just saying this i will give them this like i said it's well made for everything what everywhere is. all at once it, it it reminds me of the kind of movie and I, i'm searching for the the correct uh analog but so it's like when you're in high school and like you become like an emergent film buff and, you know, like, everyone has, like, the movies, like, anyone who is sort of, like, a film buff, too, you're sharing those movies, and, like, people be like, oh, that, like, I watched this, and it's so, like, different, it was so cool, and then, like, every now and then, like, you know, one in five of those, your friend would recommend, and you'd watch, and you'd be like, I don't get, like, I just don't get this one. So are and you this is the one that this is the Napoleon Dynamite of the moment? Hey, I, I like Napoleon Dynamite. I know, but I'm just saying it didn't really work for me, so. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no. I mean, exactly. Like, there's the movie that, like, become the the certain, like, film buff type people will get, like, fixated on, but it doesn't hit for everyone. Uh, see, I'll, I'll say, like, I, I really will say I'll, I'll bracket my, like, phys- philosophical difference disagreements with this movie. The reason why it doesn't work for me is I don't think it's a particularly good comedy, and 
it's so structured around comedy in terms of its actual storytelling. So just to clarify, I remember, Aaron, you mentioned to me briefly that you thought it wasn't super well made, but I think you've helped me clarify that you're saying it, there's script issues, there's story issues, there's yeah, yeah. structural it's that way. Thing, on in terms of cinematography, and in terms, in terms of, of special editing effects, all that, it's I fine. think what's amazing to me, and maybe you know we can talk about this later, but let's compare this movie. I can see why people who have been just spoon-fed Marvel movies uh, for the last you know five years are like wow this is visually stunning i'm like well yeah compared with this the next movie we're going to talk about <laughs> yeah yeah i mean well that's there's probably a good segue because if i think we want to do some we want to do some comparisons between the two but first let's dig into doc strange as doc strange and i did what i had to do to protect our world you cannot control everything strange opened the doorway between universes and we don't know who or what will walk through it wanda what do you know about the multiverse viz had his theories he believed it was dangerous he was right with doctor strange in the multiverse of madness sam raimi returns to superhero movies Although the new Doctor Strange is not the first Marvel installment to bring up the subject of the multiverse, played a key narrative role in Spider-Man No Way Home, for instance, it's the film that seemed meant to unleash the full potential of the multiverse for the MCU, as the title and the trailers promise mind-bending dark fantasy. In my view, the film only lives up to its potential in select scenes, while the overall handling of the multiverse cements the usual features within MCU storytelling. If everything everywhere all at once is formally marked by montage patterns to convey the scope and consequentiality of the multiverse, Doctor Strange is more formally subdued. Sure, it has the big city bending in one sequence of shifting through about a dozen universes rapidly, but overall it offers little that hasn't already been seen in other cosmic superhero movies. The best and most visually striking sequences are actually well-wrought single-location scenes, and they are the ones marked most by Rami's command of horror. In particular, I found the deteriorating universe with the bad Doctor Strange and the Rundown Tower the most interesting. In one respect, the multiverse is the cosmological embodiment of the endless sequential narration of comic book slash cinematic universe storytelling. This has long precedence in the comic book industry, actually, as different universes were used as ways to explain different eras in the history of the comics. For instance, right, like DC Golden Age versus DC Silver Age, different, uh, different planets. With No Way Home and now Doctor Strange, the multiverse also represents one studio's desire to colonize all former Marvel, probably all other superhero as well as blockbuster film universes as well. Does Disney Marvel's monopolization of the known galaxy cast a shadow over the parentalized conquest of Wanda Maximoff, the Scarlet Witch? So that's something we could explore. While No Way Home only blended casting in characters from different superhero movie eras, Doctor Strange, especially, uh, the multiverse also emphasizes the deep elusiveness, that web of intertextuality which really makes up the matrix of superhero storytelling, with Sam Raimi injecting all sorts of horror, fantasy, sci-fi, and particularly his own trademark stylistic techniques. Doctor Strange has some amazing parts, but doesn't really do all that much with infinite worlds. At one point, Strange says, how many universes have you gone to, to America Chavez, and she says, oh, 72, and he's actually impressed by that in an infinite multi multiverse and i found that weirdly small-minded and there's that just seems to convey the whole film in the end the film is about doctor strange learning to deal with his unhappiness and wanda's learning how to control her intense maternal desires while well, hollywood has always played the personal storyline alongside the adventure plot when the adventure encompasses the multiverse i'm left wondering if a different form of storytelling is needed so aaron i already asked you the lead question anders what did you think about Doctor Strange, did you like it? Am I missing the scope of the film? Well, I'll start by saying that I have kind of taken a several year hiatus from Marvel films, and I'll, I'll, some of our listeners may find these the fact that I have not seen Avengers Endgame, either the second or third Spider-Man, have not watched WandaVision or Loki. Um, people might find that surprising and may discount my opinion on this that's fine whatever um but i went into dr strange relatively on that's pretty uh, super cold like you, yeah, yeah pretty fairly cool yeah. 
Um, You've but seen the first one, right? I've seen the first Doctor Strange, yeah. and and I'm pretty familiar with super. I was a pretty serious comic book reader for a long time, um, at least up until about a decade or so ago. So I kind of went into it more for the Sam Raimi reason than anything, and you know, and I I kind of like was curious about where they would go with this because I kind of liked the first Doctor Strange. I think is one of the better films in the the Marvel universe, at least as far as like uh, initial entries. Yeah, I you know, Doctor Strange. Unlike the, everything everywhere, um, I don't feel super strongly about it one way or the other. Yeah, I don't think it's a particularly great film. I don't think it's a particularly Sam Raimi-ish film. I know people. I, I see some of the touches, and like you, Anton, those are my favorite bits of the film. My the whole bit with the the zombie Doctor Strange, if you want to call it that, where he yeah. says they ha- they have this ability similar to everything everywhere. You can kind of inhabit the body of someone from a parallel universe. Uh, well, not actually going dream, there. Dream walking, I think. They call it they call dream walking here. Yeah. yeah. And the idea is that our dreams somehow represent uh, portals to other worlds. Again, talk about dropping a really like high concept idea <laughs> and not really doing anything with it. I was like, really? Well, yeah. Wow, really? Can you imagine if dreams... Oh, what do your dark dreams say about you? That's that's pretty messed up. And there's a little, there's a couple throwaway gags with like, uh, Wong, you know, and that. But I liked the, the zombie Doctor Strange because even the way the makeup was done kind of had that like kind of like... Army of Darkness, Evil Dead oh, kind, totally, of, totally. kind of look to it. And, and the little skeleton guys flying yep, around. And that looked cool. Underworld. Remind me of like Drag Me to Hell, one of Sam Raimi's underrated horror films from like the late 2000s. But man, these movies, like you said, scope for a film that wants to be so large and huge. Ultimately, it all comes down to, um, you know, just a few characters. But at the same time, they're, they're threatening the whole universe again. Like, right? Like, so here, here's the thing, like, so they drop some really cool concepts, like the dream walking, like the relationship between dreams and the multiverse, like, right, so in a dream you're sort of seeing what an, an alternate you in a different universe is doing, but the, yeah, like, they don't, they make so little of it, or, or if they use it, it's, a, you know, it's in a specifically just sort of like one, to fulfill one plot line, but it doesn't really shape the overall mm-hmm. stuff, and then... But overall, like, this whole film is just, it's, as I said, like, it's just another Marvel movie. And that, for me, is, like, when you when you have a title, like, right, The Multiverse of Madness, I want this movie to be a little bit mad. Instead, it's just another sort of, like, one more Marvel character has resolved some sort of um, yeah. personal crisis. And the characters are, the are, universe are still has sort been of saved. Like, they'll, do, they'll do the Joss Whedon kind of quip and be like, oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, but, like, they're not doing anything... Like, everything everywhere all at once has... I can't even imagine how much less of a budget. Like, I I don't actually know the budget numbers, but, right, like, so much less. But it's actually more... In some ways, it's more compelling as a vision of multiverses. Here in, like, the Multiverse of Madness, we really get, like, one sequence where they're shifting through multiverses. And then it's kind of just like a cosmic thing where you're just, like, in a couple different worlds. Yeah. I would have liked more with the uh, the sort of world between the worlds. It reminded me a little bit of like the wood between the worlds in like C.S. Lewis and yeah. his Narnia books or something like but, that. But you have a character who can blast through and connect and like jump through the different multiverses. How do we not have an amazing chase that's blasting through all these multiverses? Like there's just at the end of the day, you're like, why are we even doing a multiverse and not just this is just like a sort of another cosmic or fantasy or just a Doctor Strange too, right? Because mm-hmm. like the coolest large scale um box you know like the sorry large scale sort of like special effects are again like the usual doctor strange like oh we're gonna like do sort of inception and like fold the city or or you have that like the the space between the universes which is kind of just like a bunch of architecture floating around at different angles it's like gardens of the galaxy yeah yeah Aaron, where are you at? So I'm at this point with marvel where i'm just like my expectations are very low uh, marvel movies are just the you know, if the, if the Marvel was a basketball player, it's like he's got a very solid floor, but a very low ceiling. Um, as in, like, it's going to come in and he's going to he's going to give you 10 points. <laughs> so are you saying like it's like if you just if you go into it being like it's a Big Mac meal and yeah. then you just want what you want and it gives you what you want? Yeah, if we're doing if, I don't want to jump right into comparison stuff, but if we're talking about um, food analogies and burger analogies, this is a Big Mac and I enjoy Big Macs. But if you eat a Big Mac every day, you'll get sick. Everything Everywhere All at Once is an interesting artisanal boutique burger, which I'm like, I don't know if all these flavors go together. 
but yeah, like why did you add the uh, the jelly in there yeah it's like i don't eat jam on my burger i think if you read too much into the title and the whole multiverse thing the movie can be quite disappointing but if you think of it as a doctor strange 2 and just another movie in the marvel universe in which they're kind of expanding their concept of the multiverse but as always with all Marvel things now, you're just they're just laying the groundwork for further stories while also resolving some of the past stories. So this is the thing that kind of frustrations with Marvel at this point. There's almost no Marvel movies that exist in and of themselves anymore. And even No Way Home, which actually I thought had like a pretty substantial emotional arc for Peter in it. Yeah. Compa- especially compared to the previous yeah, two yeah. no but in terms of giving him an actual sense of it's like he, you have to learn the lesson people can't just tell you the lesson anymore and he has to kind of come to that realization that the other spider-man do in their movies but he's never allowed because he enters the marvel universe midway through yeah. you know he doesn't yeah. really get a proper origin story in in the mcu so this movie it's like it resolves the wandavision stuff it expands a bit of the views of other universes we see in Loki, while also setting up clearly this ability of America Chavez in future movies to jump to all these different universes, also brings the Fantastic Four and the X-Men in. You have to view the multiverse within Marvel movies as like a, it's an intertextual statement. It's not... It, it, if, if everything everywhere all at once is using the multiverse as a like self-therapeutic solipsistic statement about like modern philosophy and how to self-actualize which is kind of what it's going at for it's like think of all the different choices you made in your life yeah. understand those choices have meaning it's start CBT. to own yeah. the ability that you can do moving forward and which determining those choices and how you know break free of the path that you think you're set on this movie is not about self-actualization within its multiverse storytelling the multiverse storytelling is a means of disney to continue to mold the entirety of the entertainment world around itself. Yes, that's where I was going to go with that, that the multiverse simply functions as a way to semi-diegetically incorporate other uh, superhero and uh, fantasy franchises into itself. So I agree. Like, I think, well, I think the multiverse is operating, right, on multiple levels, maybe three. But as I said in my sort of my intro, but like there's a there's a crude commercial aspect where it's like this will allow us to bring in the non Marvel Studios Marvel stuff. Right. And we did that in No Way Home. You get the other Spider-Mans and then like now we can get the X-Men in. Frankly, I didn't actually find like Xavier coming in. Like I kind of thought it was like a joke and like lame. They like wheel him out and it's like so slow and you're like. It's like it to me. It's just like at this point, like some of these cameos are playing like, you know, it's like, and now we bring out literally wheel them out. Charles Xavier. <laughs> and you're like, you're just like everyone's supposed to like clap and stand up and the whole movie like stops for like a one minute sequence of like people reacting to that. But then like set aside that woodenness. Um, then there's but I actually do think that this movie's on a uh, partly because Marvel was always about characters figuring themselves out while they're saving the world. Like, it does actually still operate on multiverse as therapeutic. Because, like, at the end of the day, Strange has to see what Strange is like in the other universes to understand that, you know, a little bit more about himself, a little bit more about his relationship with the girl he wanted. Um, Wanda is resolved by seeing finally, like, what she is, what others see her as. Mm -hmm. And again, you're like, this person has, like, destroyed how many people in how many multiverses but the fact that now she finally gets to like see herself and understand herself is that that like absolves like whatever she just did so i I still think it's operating the therapeutic and then i also think that like there's a whole thing where it's like the raimi stuff like almost then they're like we can do a little bit more like what we would just usually do is like you know this movie has maybe a little bit more directorial markers than most but they're not. They're not. They're not. Um, they're not large scale. They're flourishes. Right. They're not on the larger scale. And so it seems um, like Raimi came in to just be like, which he did. He, he admits that the film is a, a film for hire, and but he gets some flourishes people, in, and like he gets to now. put in yeah. like the canted angles, and he yep. gets to do some scenes where it's like the camera moving low and like around. Yep. And yeah, and you got Bruce Campbell in there. You, I think you hit on something again. The the, the multiverse plays to to satisfy individual validation and, and needs, like you said, which is very similar actually to uh, 
everything everywhere. But it also, I would actually say, to take it then that step back to the the fans. I mean, it's really easy to you know get angry at Disney as the the monopolizing juggernaut. But I think there's something also to this about how it reflects the fan need to have everything uh, tied up neatly. Like they can't just yeah, go yeah. and make another Fantastic Four movie. It has to be tied in. You know, we to tie it back to our previous episode. Haha. <laughs> The um, we talked about you know reboots and, and requels and stuff like that a couple of episodes yep, ago. Yep. You know how Star Trek when they did their their reboot New Trek, it couldn't just be a New Trek movie. They had to diegetically incorporate it into the universe with that opening sequence that shows yep, how you know yep. the world splits and, and these kind of things. And this is the same kind of thing. The fans have become so uh, obsessive in their uh, desire for control and incorporating it into their collection that fits neatly that they can't just be like, well, now we're going to go make this movie. Um, it, it's all about satisfying that. There's solipsistic desire in the fan, I think. But you're, but you're putting like, so like the agency and the decisions is like, it's not all on like the fan. I guess what I'm just no, saying no, is of like, course not. Of course essentially not. I, like ho- Hollywood, in- Hollywood saw the potential out of out of fandom and that if they could turn all of their ten pull movies into fandoms, yep. then then that will supply that will supply like what they need. And they've need done it with directors too. Office. Like at this point, yep. you know, we got to get the old Spider-Man director in. We got to get the the previous Academy Award winner in. You know, like but you, but Aaron's but right really in that f- this isn't like it's not totally new if you're into comic books. No, because of course not. All comic books were always ridiculous for continuity, and they're like expecting you to read like five different series and buy those to understand. And the character would show up and be like. Oh, hey, uh, Peter Parker. And you're like, you know, like I'd read the comic and be like, I don't know who that is. I'd maybe ask you and be like, oh, he was has this other storyline they're doing. And you don't quite have to get it all. But but because the stakes were a little bit lower, mon- they were there was still, yeah, you had Crisis and Infinite Earths trying to clean up the continuity and things like that. But actually, the result was less shoehorning things in. It was actually to open things up more for, for later creators, yeah. right? Um, I feel like this is like the, the reverse impulse in a weird yeah, way. Yeah. It's it's channeling everything into one single line. It's bringing um, everything into one universe. And, and because comic sites, like, like I said, were lower it's stakes, there was an, uh, like it's literally like the Borg, right? It's like incorporating everything into itself to use yep. a Star Trek metaphor again. Yeah. So Wanda is, um, like I suggested, oh, like, you know, like, can we think of Wanda as like sort of the dim, the Disney Marvel, right? Like conquering the different multiverses to, to bring what they want but then maybe maybe uh, what really needs to happen is a self-reflective moment where it's like the fans need to be like, think of themselves as Wanda and do you really need to have like all those things that you you like brought into like this one mm-hmm. this one universe? Because like that that to me even going back to like No Way Home, like I love the Tobey Maguire uh, first two Spider Mans, enjoy the third. I thought Andrew Garfield was a fine Peter Parker and I had fun seeing them together. But at the end of the day, like, I didn't need that. And that's, like, the thing. It's, like, there is, like, this intense, like, Wanda's almost channeling the the need to, like, have all these things come in. And, like, we need now, like, X-Men to be to be drawn into this universe. And we have to, like, it's an, it's an insatiable, bizarre, like, desire. I, that's, I think that's is a compelling reading, but I just... <laughs> Maybe I don't. I don't see. I don't think it's there. It like, doesn't. I mean, uh, yet it, it won't pay off. It won't work, right? It won't change anything. I guess, in other words, you break the rules. Look out! You become a hero. I do it. I become the enemy. That doesn't seem fair. But I did like I did want to say that um, I thought uh, Elizabeth Olsen is very good as Wanda in this. Uh, they give her a little bit more to do than some of the other ones I've seen. I haven't watched WandaVision, but I might but yeah, be like the earlier to Avengers check out some of the episodes stuff. now. She always seemed a Although little I, bit like superfluous. Yeah. Although I know that some fans of WandaVision I have read uh, did not like what they did with her in this movie. So. We've come to this idea, and this might dovetail into the therapeutic stuff about this storytelling in general, but it's like, can we just acknowledge that the decisions she makes preclude us, like me? I shouldn't have to care about whether she gets any emotional resolution after doing how many horrible things in this movie. That, like, she, I don't know, like, she, the amount of, like, death that she wreaks on people because she thinks she deserves something. And the movie is like, well, she does deserve it because she's really suffered. And it's like, no, she makes other people suffer. 
what happened to these movies having a actual discussion about what it means to be a hero with fantastic powers and like what the cost of that is have they ever had that since the first so one of my biggest things first watching Iron Man Marvel, is the only one <laughs> watching no way home and then doctor strange i do think that there's like so the first doctor strange has a uh, like a moral arc to the character But I actually think that one of the things, so watching these later installments, one, I'm struck by how much they actually feel like Marvel comic books, even older Marvel comic books with like, you know, in some sense, it's like, I understand the appeal. It's just like this endless story that will never end. And there's the characters you like and you hop in and you see what adventure they have. And then like, you can just dispense with it. And they've built up now the universe and it can just keep churning and like, it's 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 almost like self sustaining, right? Like, so like they plant um, Wanda how many movies ago, and she seems like she's not important, but all of a sudden now she can have sort of like this like story arc fulfillment, and like there is something interesting about that. But but what these films lack is I'm never struck by there being any um, real like real arc for characters ever since their origin movies. And not even, like, as you said, like, the the Tom Holland Spider-Man never gets a, an origin arc. But, like, in Iron Man, in the first Iron Man, Tony Stark has, like, a, a change. He goes, undergoes his change, but then they sort of, like, redo, undo that in, like, subsequent things. And, like, Doctor Strange has to learn not to be such an egotistical ass. And, like, you know, like, that he's not, like the be all and the end all. But again, then you kind of like dispense with some of that and they never create like a compelling um, arcs for like the later films. The films, the only thing that's compelling about the later installments is how they thread together the different threads of the storylines, but they're never compelling in and of themselves. The first Iron Man has an interesting story about Tony, Tony Stark and what happens to him. And the first like two Spider-Man movies, like Spider-Man one and Spider-Man two have that not the Tom Holland ones, but like what happens in Dr. Strange? Tell me the story of Dr. Strange and the multiverse of madness. It's not a good story. And you can't tell it to me in like in two, three sentences, but like, that's what these things are lacking. There's, there's actually no, they should, in, they could dig into some things, right? Like Wanda Scarlet, Witch is like this, like all consuming mother. Like you could dig into like the archetypal of that and really push it, but they're just interested in sort of like, having the arc complete itself and then moving on to the next installment. So what do you guys think in terms of comparing the two things? Do you think either has a more compelling view of the multiverse? Are we seeing more similarities than we thought? And then formally, Aaron, I wanted to to get your opinion on like, you said you didn't love some of the formal aspects of everything, everywhere, all at once. But how do you think like the montage of the different multiverses goes up against, say, that sequence where we get the different places. And then if you guys want to bring in this whole talk about, like, why do we even have a paint universe? And then why is it that we have multiverses that will produce a paint version of Doctor Strange, but we don't get universes that don't have Doctor Strange? That's a lot of questions. (laughs) (laughs) No, so on on level... I feel like I should almost turn in my critic card, which I obviously don't have, but... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> no, if if I make the comment as being like, ultimately, I probably enjoy Doctor Strange more than everything everywhere all at once. Partially because the movie is trying to make me feel less. I don't know. It, 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 does the, is that a fair just assessment to say that a movie is not asking as much of me? Therefore, it becomes just passive entertainment and it fulfills what it, the bargain that it gives in me yeah. going to see it more than the other movie because the other movie seems like it wants to change my life. Yeah, because yeah it, that, but that's and that's the thing. It's like <laughs> this wasn't part of the bargain. <laughs> I didn't come here to you know be convinced. And if that was the bargain, you failed. So that's just like overall take. I'm I'm not like strong on Doctor Strange, Multiverse of Madness. Yeah, yeah. I weirdly enough, I so I watched Loki last summer when there was almost like no new television out. So I was just kind of grasping at anything I could watch and. In retrospect, that show had a has a much more interesting view of multiverses than this. Because like you get more variations and versions and you get an actual weird vision of what it could possibly look like if you have discarded people from different universes. Hmm. Um, it's not a great series or anything, and it is beholden to all the other Marvelisms too, but at least it goes down some avenues, perhaps because television allows that. 
in the, in the format. I'm, I'm interested to compare this film, these films, to um, another superhero film that used parallel universes and multiverses was uh, Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse, which uh, I thought does a better job of using the idea of uh, the multiverse to to forward the sort of main narrative arc between Miles and uh, the Peter from Earth. I guess it's six one six, right? And the um, but it doesn't actually delve as much into the, uh, the mechanics of it and stuff, which actually works really well. Other than you just know that the villain, you know, has Kingpin has a this thing that's sucking things in from different universes. So it it actually. Uh, it, it forestalls the, the question of like how many there are or what different ones there are. Yep. Right? Um, and, but it also gives it much more variety. And so you have quite silly things like the uh, Spider Noir from the black and white uh, universe voiced by Nicolas Cage and stuff like that, you know? Um, yeah, I don't know. I also thought it played with like that kind of like hyperactive and like knowing tone much better than than either of these films. So ironically, it's both a superhero film, but it also is kind of feels a little bit like the sort of like, uh, you know, a lot of people really found it heartwarming and, uh, you know, meaningful in some way, which I don't know, that might be pushing a bit more, but it definitely was inventive and I thought did a better job. I think that movie makes it, it has a more of a moral center Absolutely. that actually is consistent within the story. And I actually like that it uses the multiverse for flourishes, but mm-hmm. not as... It's really just a story about Miles and his dad. Yeah, exactly. At the end of it. And it actually like commits to that enough. So it's it's interesting comparing how like multiverse has become, you know, like 8 years ago, multiverse was kind of the the thing in pop science. It was <laughs> talked about constantly and yeah. then it and then really what happened is that in like 2013 or 14, I forget which year, 2013, when they actually um, measured the Higgs boson, right? at the um super Sorry. the hadron collider in in uh europe it's essentially proved that the c- conception of multiverse within theoretical a- astrophysics doesn't actually make any sense dependent on the the quantum weight of the the higgs boson well, there- so so that fell out but but because culture always works slightly at a different you know it's a delay so it seems like pop culture is picking up on multiverses and it's like well we can't actually get into the science stuff of it we're n- nobody's interested in that nobody really likes science even though everybody's all the like it's because you know, the, science uh, bumper stickers and stuff but we can use it as a means of yeah. extrapolating about why does our world suck so much and how do why do we yeah. feel so bad about ourselves yeah and because the multiverse <clears throat> is a, like it, it it is a uh well i think you're right like it's an it's it's sort of like an explainer for like sort of the cultural ennui slash uh people's concerns about so i I do a course on originality we in one of the last weeks we talk about like franchise world right like this world of like tv and television and uh, movies where it's just like you know all these franchises which cuts into what we're talking about here but everyone seems to both partake in it but also sense that there's something like kind of messed up about it and like is there any way out of just this never-ending franchise world. But I think the multiverse becomes the like the cosmological embodiment slash explainer for the present, like postmodern cultural landscape. And which is why it's just like it just it's like it becomes so useful. And it's it's, it's so the perfect. It's so perfect that it's the now the superstructure for Marvel. Yeah. It's perfect. And now I want them to do the Patton Oswalt and they're gonna start bringing in like Star <laughs> Wars flying in and like all this stuff. That's- we might be exhausting the comparisons here yeah. and stuff, but I do want to briefly talk about the aesthetic. So Marvel has that extreme backlit um, CGI oh, studio look, right? Like you, not a single street or wall even looks re- necessarily real. So it actually does best when it's in these kind of fantastic comic splash panel formats, like in the you know the paint universe, the jumping through, the where the um, that specific book that he's trying to get, or that you know. So in terms of like visual construction, Doctor Strange is not particularly great. Even though I actually think the whole sequence in that kind of fallen strange yeah. world is quite cool, and the stairway that goes yes. up to like forever. Mm-hmm. How do you get moments like that, that within that's a great it? Image, yeah. How do you get moments like that within the film? But, but I and I even appreciate that Rami is able to put in 
a little bit more bloodshed into a fairly bloodless Marvel universe. Like, characters actually have blood on their hands in this. That strange gets impaled. There's, like, some pretty gruesome stuff. And again, there is... Wanda, carry kind of blood. Like. Yeah, there is, there is a possibility hinted at here. Not necessarily explored. And the ending kind of hints at more. But I don't know, knowing Marvel, they'll never really dig into it enough. But I like the fact that Strange has to, like, flirt with the the dead and the evil in order to overcome it's like they're they're constantly ca- talking about the movie it's like if you use the dark hold it has this cost and that's the whole thing that makes wanda go too far but this idea of like strange has to bring that upon himself just to and de- defeat her by like pulling all those evil spirits to himself and it, it makes for some cool visuals as you guys yeah. have pointed out i i like that stuff and i thought actually again compared to the first doctor strange as well i think these two movies are more clever in their kind of quote-unquote action climax than the average Marvel movie in that it's not just a bunch of explosive punching or like a CGI um, battle-a-thon. It actually has some kind of conceptual idea that it plays with. Like in the first one, it's yeah. the time loop, right? And this one, it's the zombie. Do you find it interesting that like, I, I was really struck by how the the way they visualize um, the magicians casting spells is essentially... Um, like it, it's Tom Cruise in Minority Report, yeah, yeah. working Screams. working the visual screen. So one also that's interesting because G. that becomes that's like a reference yeah. point for like all sorts of sci-fi inter- stuff. Sense right? Yeah, like that, it's also that, interesting that they distinguish between sorcery and witchcraft. Yeah, well, that raises the whole thing of like so. There's a multiverse, but then there's also seems to be like a spiritual plane that's operating not on the multiverse plane because if it goes below it, there's an underworld place, right? Yeah. yeah. In this. So maybe they'll explore it. That'd be cool if they had an underworld movie where he goes down. But he also, like, so, okay, yeah, there's the Tai Chi aspect. But it also, it, the way they will, like, sort of, like, cycle through things, it also becomes very, like, it's, like, very, like, it's very, like, cinematic, right? Like, you're literally, like, selecting, like, Frames. A, a movie frame that you want. But it's your iPhone they, or your they, iPad. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, scrolling through, and but it then also he throws looks like it out. the Omni tool from Mass Effect. <laughs> but it, he pull. They also then pull in stuff from like it, right. It's the referential. Like it's like he can like pull in something from right. Like the way he like all of a sudden oh like now I'll turn you into like you know like now it's the Inception world was like the one where things are gonna fold on top. But then it, like it'll be like now you're gonna turn into like you know uh, you're frozen and like it's just like he does all these. There is something interestingly cinematic about it. Yeah, well, so what I was going to say in the comparison is essentially that I think Rami does some little interesting things within the Marvel host style, but the Marvel host style is the Marvel host style. It's not particularly that appealing. Again, compared to everything, everywhere, all at once, which aspects I like. I like the use of center framing to connect characters that throughout, like where you put them right in the center of the frame, you match cut. It loves to use mm-hmm. mash cuts to do the various versions. It likes to do the whole idea of kind of characters exiting or entering the frame, and that is your transition moment between the universes, right? Like, you know, the head will get, like, knocked in, and then yeah. you'll, yep. like, flip it to the next one. The thing I don't like, and which I actually think I would combat a claim of, like, extreme originality stylistically in that movie, is that whenever it goes to an action sequence or it goes to a montage, it turns into music video conventions in the same way that Doctor Strange is playing with Marvel conventions at this point, where the lights dim, the aspect ratio often changes actually to like an anamorphic widescreen. The frame rate slightly gets jittery in moments, and it uses kind of overwhelming music. It makes, you know, it pulls sound effects out, and it just blends all these into this kind of stream of imagery and music coming at you. To the point where you're, it's supposed to be like the swell right at the end of the music video, like the four or five minutes in. And I know you guys haven't seen Swiss Army Man, but like Swiss Army Man actually goes into like musical interludes in the film where there's, oh, like, there's original songs. The, the characters aren't singing or anything, but there'll be like original songs that play. And, or I don't know if it's original, but whatever. There's like music playing, there's there's needle drops, and it will go into almost slow motion sequences of the characters doing things in like tableau or whatnot. And it turns into, it's like, oh, you know, every 20 minutes you get like a two minute music video. And I felt like this was taking that, but the other way, you don't input tw- music video sequences into a 40 minute film. You just stretch a two minute music video into a 40 minute sequence. Hmm. And, and, and my ultimate thing is that I don't love music video style either. <laughs> <laughs> you know yeah i just think like Except if we're for gonna, michael bay <laughs> i 
I just feel like I don't want to, uh, I want a different, I want another, uh, option in my multiverse. Like, I don't want to just have to choose between the, uh, quirky originality of everything everywhere all at once or the never-ending Marvel of yeah. Doctor well, Strange. Unfortunately, your option might be, uh, Into the Spider-Verse, <laughs> which splits the difference between the two. <laughs> this could literally not get any weirder. It can get weirder. Well, as always, thanks so much for listening, and we'll catch you next time. Goodbye, Mr. Bond. I bid you farewell.